So we, we do have a, so you're going to learn all about how we've taken the technology of our company and made it into what goes inside that box right there. So Brad is probably displaying it. If you'd like to be our spokesperson, we'd love to have one. Um, some wonderful box holding skills. Um, but yeah, so I'll just jump right into it. Uh, thank you everybody here for taking yet more time to understand what we do here at BrainCo and how we've entered the education market with some really cool stuff. Uh, thank you so much, Peyton Group. I agree with everything Chris said. Um, this has been a very professional event. And I think it's been something that is really nice to have when it seems like everything in the world has been canceled. I'm actually broadcasting to you from Boston here, where it's pretty remarkable. I've driven in Boston for the past four months and have not had one uh, slowdown in traffic ever, which is unbelievable compared to what life normally is. I'm sure you're encountering similar things out there. Um, yeah, so that's the world we live in. And uh, to meet that, uh, so what I'm going to talk about here today is a little bit of our company's background, where we come from, what kind of tech we have, and then how we've incorporated all that into a educational product that, that combines uh, AI, uh, programming, uh, all kinds of different engineering uh, within this uh, perspective of the missions that our company goes for. And then finally, I'll be able to give you a little bit of time to answer questions and kind of go through that. So this whole thing will be about uh, 20, 25 minutes. And you know, we've got a nice group here today. So if you want to jump in with any questions, feel free to do that. I'm also joined here by Josh Valera. Uh, who is um, our associate director for strategic partnerships? I mean, like, he'll be jumping in and out with different thoughts, and I'm really excited to do this. So, without further ado, I'll get straight into it. Okay. So first, um, if you've already listened to one of these, then please forgive me. I got to say the same corny joke, but um, I've been told to gloat a little bit before I do these things, so people understand a little bit of my background. Um, so if you can see in the top left-hand corner. Um, I actually worked with uh, FIRST Robotics for a very long time, so about uh, seven, seven years in different respects. Um, and I started off managing their STEM education program in China. Um, so if you're familiar with FIRST, they have the four different programs going from um, like more or less K to 12. And uh, I was in charge of all those. And then I worked with uh, Dean Kamen here and a few other people to start a new initiative, which brought robotics to 163 countries. Um, so it's been a really great pleasure of mine to find different ways that we can include STEM into kind of interesting packages. Um, so I, I was like a STEM spokesperson in China. If you really want to torture yourself, on the bottom right-hand corner, um, I was actually a panelist on a uh, Chinese um, talk show and talked all about educational initiatives and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so any kind of international stuff, you can find it on YouTube if you want to see me speak uh, bad Chinese. Um, that's always fun. And uh, yeah, so with that background. What we really wanted to do was to find a way that we could take really amazing technology incubated at the Harvard iLab and put it into students' hands in something that's not a line-following robot, you know, not another kind of like circuit set or something like that, something really engaging and that actually came from real technology. So a little background about our company. Uh, we were incubated in the Harvard iLab in 2014, uh, so we've been around for a few years, and we've developed uh, mostly brain-machine interface technology products. So different ways that we can take in brain signals, muscle signals, nervous systems, nervous system signals, and process that into some kind of output. So we've used a lot of that uh, technology in education, healthcare, and consumer products. Um, so we've gotten uh, you know tons of great stuff out there. And uh, the one way to start this off is uh, this this educational journey that you're going to learn about today really started with this product that you see on the screen right now. This is our brain robotics AI powered Dexus prosthetic hand. So this is an actual prosthetic that uh, incorporates all the different technology that I just talked about um, into uh, something an amputee could use. So what happens here is it's a mechanical prosthetic with different motors, and uh, what happens is uh, we've developed EMG sensors that uh, an amputee would put on their arm, and we through our machine learning algorithms, we can detect how an amputee wants to control that uh, prosthetic uh, through some different algorithms we put together. And then over the span of about 30 minutes, they can learn how to control the hand with their own muscle signals. So um, it's been a really fun project for engineers to take on. Um, so we've been able to equip the amputees here in the U.S. We've also been able to work with lots of partners overseas. Uh, so Mr. Nee here is really cool. He actually runs a nonprofit in Asia that uh, enables amputees to kind of live their second life and uh, gain uh, access in the areas that they didn't originally have. So we took a step back and we looked at this. And there really is a lot of cool educational capital here. Like as you can see, we have all kinds of material sciences that people can look into. 
We have different kinds of biomechanics that people can look into, AI, um, all this stuff that's come together and can be really put into an educational set that's not really out there at the moment. Uh, so a, a cool way to investigate all these different technologies. And not just like any old set, but um, the backing of this actual prosthetic has had a lot of awards too. So our prosthetic won uh, the Time Magazine, one of the best inventions of 2019. You can see it right here uh, on the bottom picture. Uh, it's won tons of awards at CES, uh, Red Dot Award. Um, so we really found an amazing story that we could take this experience that our engineers had to develop this kind of technology and reverse engineer it into something that a student could experience. So uh, the key factor in here is, you know, and like what will be the rest of our presentation is how did we take this experience the engineers had and turn it into some kind of a kit that in this case we could offer to uh, middle school and high school students and would be easy to implement in the classroom and would keep students' engagement a lot more than some of the other robotic sets out there. So uh, this is when I get to present to you um, the whole kit that we put together and that you saw held up on the camera a few minutes ago. Um, so what you will see now is the Brinko STEM kit that incorporates all those things that we just talked about. So we've taken that original prosthetic, uh, we've you know made sure that the basic design elements were there so that students could experience them but made it way more affordable and into more of an educational, uh, like semi-consumer product uh, format. So all the things that we've done in the hardware reflect something that was on the original prosthetic. Um, the electronics that the students have to put together uh, reflect something there too. Um, all the algorithms that they develop, uh, the programming interface, um, they're all based on that original prosthetic experience. And to take a look at it from more of a technical point of view, um, this is what students end up getting, students and educators end up getting when they get one of those sets. Um, so they get a all the hardware pieces that they need to put everything together. Um, they get an in-browser pl programming platform, so they have a way to interact with their hardware. Uh, we also give uh, five different curriculum units. Uh, so if you add up everything together, it's about 40 hours of curriculum. If you take advantage of some of our open design competitions, uh, some of our activities, all that kind of stuff, not to mention the more traditional lectures that we can offer as well. And we finally offer a creative challenge outlet. So mm -hmm. students and educators are interested in taking this idea to the next level. They want to they customize it a lot more. They can actually create a submission of their own way that they would use this technology and submit it to our engineers uh, who will review it and actually give out some cash prizes and all kinds of different opportunities. Um, just a couple of things to touch on the, the hardware first. Um, so everything is meant to be uh, used multiple times. Um, so we see most of these kits being used um, anywhere from like 30 to 50 builds. Um, so you can build them up, tear them down. Uh, you can do a like a half tear down if you want students to experience one per, part of the kit over the other and move it to the next student group or however you want to cycle those throughout the classroom. Um, as I mentioned before, all the hardware pieces here reflect some element of that prosthetic. Um, so the, there's special tendon wires that can uh, like control the actual movement of the hand. Um, so we have, it's powered by a like an Arduino controller, uh, which can integrate with a lot of other stuff going on in the classroom and uh, sensors and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we make sure that students get that full experience from the hardware package. And that takes us into our programming. Uh, so our uh, our programming is available uh, for, for free. Uh, so there's no like added cost to any of that, uh, not to mention our curriculum as well. I'll be talking about our curriculum a little bit more in depth in a minute, but um, the way that we set up our offering is that uh, once people have the kit, they have access to all the different things that we've developed the activities, the curriculum, the competition, the programming, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, just to touch base on the programming for a moment, we utilize a program called mBlock. Uh, and mBlock is, it was originally a Scratch 3.0 enhancement. Uh, so was, I'm sure you're out there familiar with Scratch and block-based programming. But what's nice about this, um, that some other block-based programming um, uh, systems don't have, is you can toggle between a uh, text and block-based. So you can see the relationship between those two different kinds of code. And it's, it'll, it'll be compatible with uh, the computers that work in the classroom. It comes with a companion <coughs> app. So if people are out there doing uh, programming in a remote environment, you can download it on whatever your, your tablets are or what have you. And you don't need to download an actual program onto a whole computer lab. So you can do it all in browser. Just a little extension you got to put in there to make it compatible with the kit. Um, so if you haven't used this system before, you can go into the, um, the browser and check it out. Yeah, and then I got a couple of prepared videos here just so you can get an idea of how everything works. Um, so this is what the completed build of the kit looks like. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was enough uh, mechanical flexibility in there 
but also um, the simplicity was at a point where some of our novice educators would be able to approach this technology quite easily. Um, and we've seen that a lot from educators out there in the classroom. Um, and here's one of the included uh, features in the, the hardware. So every kit comes with an IR sensor, uh, so they can start co uh, moving the kit right out of the box. Um, and here's where we're introducing a whole series of different accessories. So here's one of them, the gesture glove, where you can control the hand in real time. And we connect this with a bunch of different prototyping exercises. Uh, people use this to investigate different kinds of biomechanics and physics, all that kind of stuff. Um, so those things can all be integrated into different curricular areas. Yeah, and here's a very simple example of how uh, some of our younger learners have been able to utilize this kit. So as I mentioned, we like to have a whole series of activities and curriculum available for people going from, uh, so in this case, it was actually students as young as fifth grade, uh, but it's like middle school throughout high school, but so whatever proficiency is in different kinds of uh, technology that they have something that they can do. Uh, so one of the more simple examples here, uh, they were able to code that up in M-Block with our block-based programming, uh, design one of our uh, open game challenges. Uh, so in this case, they made something pretty simple, and as you can see here, uh, they've manipulated this hardware so that I can uh, keep track of this game that the student developed. So not everything has to be biotech related. Um, that's certainly where a lot of our um, activities lie, but this can be expanded into a much more you know, comprehensive uh, offering into a, an open-ended STEM class. So uh, the original prosthetic that we had has a heavy basis in AI, um, like I said before, so we wanted to make sure that there was plenty of AI functions that students could uh, experience while using this kit. So we have three of them on here. Uh, so this one is hand gesture recognition. Uh, so you can actually use M-Block to uh, make different uh, movements based on the, uh, ge the hand gestures that you put into the, uh, the camera. Um, I'm just gonna take a look at the chat while we're talking. So you can actually, um, uh, so you can actually uh, manipulate the kit uh, through the, the camera there. Uh, let's see here. Yep, and I can see, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Chris and Roger for um, cleaning up those questions. So I'll keep going here and like open up some more time to take some more in-depth ones. Yeah, and so another AI function that we have here, uh, this is um, the student's first steps into computer vision. Uh, so AI has become a much more popular uh, topic area. I feel like uh, AI is starting to supplant STEM and uh, more of the basic, I think programming education has kind of had its, a big day in the sun recently. And moving towards the AI is going to be a much bigger uh, topic area that educators are going to be interested in teaching their students, a lot more initiatives. So here's another one. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, text recognition. So students can, so we supply uh, different uh, like printed items that uh, students could be able to use to have different activities work with this kind of a function. Otherwise, you know, as you can see here, uh, like barely legible or semi-legible writing can actually be used by uh, this kit as well. So you can have a lot of interaction there with different kinds of uh, games or activities or, or uh, biomedical um, explorations. And finally, we do have a, a speech recognition. The sound might not come through, um, but you can see with that um, line at the bottom that uh, by giving different vocal commands, uh, there's a natural language processing element to uh, this system as well. So if people want to learn the basics behind an Amazon Echo or a Google Home or something like that, uh, they're able to take those concepts and apply it to something a little bit different. So that's a quick look at what the, the kit itself actually looks like in movement. So it does more than that too, uh, not to mention like all the different things that you get to do through the build. Uh, but I'll take a moment now to talk about our curriculum. So we always wanted to make sure that no matter what kind of function or uh, accessory or uh, base kit that we had, there was always curriculum to work with it. Um, I know that Probably most of you out there are very familiar with technology and could teach this stuff with your eyes closed. Uh, but for those teachers that don't have that kind of support, um, and a matter of fact, our first uh, users of this product were actually people who were kind of roped into STEM. You probably know somebody like this or have worked with a client like that who this, the school wanted to set up a fab lab or a makerspace, and they just kind of voluntold somebody to do it. So actually, our first user was a, a former gym teacher who had to be uh, capable of conducting STEM education in the classroom. So we wanted to make sure that throughout that whole um, proficiency band that there was lots of different things they could take advantage of. So what we've done is we've developed a series of activities and um, like content area uh, explorations along these different modules. So in the next slide, you'll be able to see how it's broken down into time. 
but as far as topic areas go, um, we've started off every student with our project guided assembly, where students go through the, the very basics of mechanical and electrical engineering as they apply to our kit. And then once they have their kit up and built through that uh, curriculum, they can then go into a series of other modules. They can explore biotech and biomedical exploration, uh, where they can get their feet wet with some of those concepts there, advanced prosthetics, neuroscience, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they can look at engineering design. I know that's a popular CTE class. So if you're looking to incorporate this kind of a product or a curricular area, something a little bit new into a class like that, we have curriculum that supports that. Same with programming. Uh, we actually have lessons available for uh, lab sciences. So there's different experiments that students can do um, with natural sciences uh, and biology. And as I mentioned before, we also have that open challenge that students can use as well. So here's a quick uh, look at what the curriculum looks down, broken down by time. Uh, so we've taken the, the intention behind a lot of this was so that an educator could kind of mix and match things that work for their classroom. So at the end of the presentation, I've got a couple of examples of how schools actually use these. So depending on whatever works for your class, um, there's some way that we can put it together there. We also have curriculum and pipeline all the time. So we are developing a series of different AI activities that students can do along with a 3D printing curriculum so that students can take out you know, we've seen a lot of 3D printers in fab labs and classrooms and stuff like that, find out that they're not really used as much as they could be. Um, so this could be another basis that people could use to um, uh, kind of expand into that kind of learning. So that's a quick look at what the kit does and the curriculum that supports a lot of the in-class use of it. Um, if there are students out there that want to go the extra mile and build something of their own, so every year we host the Neuromaker Creative Challenge, which we give a big topic area every year where students investigate, uh, they, they research the issues that exist in that space, and then they come up with ideas of how technology can be used to solve those. So this year, we're challenging students from around the world to use our kit, along with anything else they'd like, to develop a prototype of a solution for something that an amputee would face. Um, so on August 10th, we're going to provide all of the materials needed for students to get started, um, and all kinds of frameworks they can use, the rubrics we'll use to uh, judge the submissions, and then of course, we'll be giving out a bunch of prizes and other perks. So students will end up creating a physical prototype. And like once again, they're free to use whatever else is in their classroom. Uh, we've had students use before anything from rubber gloves to other 3D printed stuff. Um, it really depends on what the student uh, wants to do. They would sum up just investigated the programming and haven't done uh, anything to the actual exterior. Um, but then uh, students will submit a video and a written report to us uh, so that we can judge them. Uh, so it's very remote friendly. Uh, the impetus of this project actually came from our rural schools who couldn't go to local science fairs or STEM conferences or anything like that because they were too far away. So this way they could submit everything online and wouldn't have to worry about that. And what's really cool is the people who review these projects are the same as those who developed the original prosthetic that you saw earlier. So these include our company's founder, uh, Mr. Han, who's an MIT innovator under 35. Uh, Dr. Jamal came out of the MIT Brain Machine Interface postdoc program. Uh, she's actually a senior research scientist here at BrainCo. Uh, Dr. Worth and Dr. Wu are on the software and the mechanical side of that prosthetic, so they get to put their input in there as well. And uh, I'm a product of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I've worked with um, our other alumni and school resources to uh, put together the learning frameworks and uh, rubrics behind this competition. So uh, we're really lucky to have all the people involved in this panel. Uh, right now, uh, we're offering our top winners uh, $1,000. Uh, so, and as time goes on, we're always adding new stuff. So, uh, feel free to stay tuned to what our official announcement is. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot more than just that. Um, and as I mentioned before, we'll be releasing that stuff on August 10th. Students can build all the way up until December, and we release the results in January. So, it's a nice fall project, and we'll be able to do other rounds of it in the future, too. So, just a quick look at how other schools have implemented this. Uh, you've probably been able to see different elements of this in, uh, in, in your educational experiences, but just to give you a little bit of, um, of an idea of what people have used with this particular product, we've seen a lot of uh, one-day one day workshops, whether they're half-day or full-day. You're kicking off a, a new makerspace, uh, maybe introducing a new uh, program into a after-school learning environment. We have the curriculum and the resources that students can do a half-to-full-day build with all kinds of activities. Um, and so the pictures you see here are actually taken at the Yale School of Engineering, where we ran summer programs with uh, a number of partners. So um, it all comes out of that experience. We've also seen this uh, very popularly used as a, a module within something that's already going on in a CTE class or a STEM class or something like that. So you saw what our curriculum was. If you're looking at integrating 
you know, you're looking at integrating um, some kind of a three week sprint of investigating whatever your curricular topic is with this biotech background. Uh, so your engineering design class, you're looking at 3D printing different stuff and you want to have this new spin to it, uh, not to mention all the programming elements and kind of more of a comprehensive way to look at things. Um, it's a great fit. Um, it's worked really well in uh, the different uh, STEM elective classes, um, lab sciences, that kind of stuff. Um, so these are always a big hit. And finally, the one that I get the most excited about is these kids can really move around the school. Uh, so we worked with a school in Boston. It was actually a group of ninth graders. Uh, one group of ninth graders was doing a uh, introduction to programming class. Another group was doing a, a biotech class. And the biotech kids actually spent three weeks uh, using our kit to build up the hand and then go through our biotech curriculum. And they then figured out that they needed to have certain motions programmed into the kit to meet some uh, like interest areas that they identified. So these two classes met together in a joint session. And then the biotech kids passed the kits on to the programming kids, where the programming kids then used the knowledge that they built up to that point with programming to code what the biotech kids wanted. So it's a great way to move stuff around the classroom. Those same synergies can happen between a like a different CTE class or a different um, lab science class, whatever it may be. Uh, but they, they definitely don't get used for a couple days and sit on the shelf. They, they tend to move around in a school. And uh, just wrapping up this uh, presentation here, I wanted to make sure we had uh, at least a little bit of time to touch on some of the remote learning readiness that we've done here at BrainCo. You know, we all know what world we live in now. Uh, so what we've done is we've converted all our curriculum assets to be easily usable on uh, Google Classroom. So a lot of the previous presentations or lesson guides that we've had, we've all converted into some kind of a Google file or um, some other kind of easily shareable element um, our creative challenge was always remote friendly, uh, so it certainly thrives in an environment like this. We provide all kinds of checklists and materials so that educators can be sure that their, uh, their kits are clean and ready to go for the next group of students if they are moving kits around the classroom or wherever they may be. Our coding platform is all online. Uh, it's, it's on our coding curriculum. You know, students could do that without the hardware. Um, of course, like we hope there is like some kind of a hardware integration at some point, but there's no reason why they can't do that piece of it um, wherever they may be. And finally, we have taken the activities that students would do without uh, within those different curricular areas and uh, made sure that there's independent projects that students can do um, even without hardware in front of them. So they can go through these different content modules that uh, a teacher could uh, prescribe to them and check in at certain points, and then they have to develop some kind of uh, framework around those different uh, content objectives that they reach. Uh, so they can do everything that's absolutely possible without the hardware. And we hope, ideally, at some point in the future, they'll be able to actually implement that knowledge that they had uh, onto the hardware itself. But we've made sure that those two things are separate and they can um, you know, exist separately if need be. So uh, last piece of it, the work with the Peyton Group is great. Um, so if you have uh, any need to get set up with this kid, I highly recommend you get in touch with them. Um, on a, another note, uh, just a way to kickstart if you're interested in working with um, uh, getting a kit into your own hands, we're doing a, a STEM kit giveaway. Um, so we are raffling off one kit uh, to make sure that people have that kit in their hands to do evaluation or whatever else they want to do. So if you are interested in that, you're free to type, into, type in that link and fill out that form and we can get you into that raffle. And uh, that's uh, the nuts and the bolts of it. So uh, no sad pun intended. Um, I'd be happy to take any of your questions, hear your thoughts, and uh, once again, really want to thank the Peyton Group. Uh, we've had a, an amazing time these past few days, and um, you've proven to be really great people to work with, so we do thank you for helping us out, uh, getting involved in this weird remote education time. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, Andrew, can you uh, put the giveaway link in the chat? Sure. I will actually put that in the dialogue so you can just copy and paste it. Awesome. Thank you. And you know, any, any question would be great. Uh, we, for us, uh, this is Josh, by the way. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for leading the charge. It's been a, a busy day for us here at BrainCo. We had some meetings uh, to wrap up over on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, but to push some things further along that Andrew was saying, you know, this is a real amazing way to get your, if you want to get into that CAD design, if you really want to push it for us, we always love to share our experience as being a, a startup company and at the same time 
fostering new innovation amongst the next generation of learners. That's something that we believe is our is a core belief of the company. Um, and that's why our creative challenge is structured the way it is, is because uh, we want them to have those interactions and think about the career readiness and the career pathway of that biotech, biomedical area. Um, additionally, of course, we're going to be expanding the kit and we're going to be offering some really amazing accessories, a little peek behind the curtain. Um, we are looking at making some really cool stuff with EMG technology. So EMG yeah. technology is pretty much how most AI prosthetics works. Uh, for those who don't know what EMG is, it's the electrical nerve impulses that, you know, pretty much make your hand move that travel from your brain to your uh, your fingers and so on. So we are going to implement that in there. Additionally, as a company, we do also make some really amazing EEG technology. I'm throwing around a lot of these acronyms that I don't even know the answers to. So, <laughs> but EEG pretty much is um, uh, pretty much the electrical signal that your brain is giving off. And we do already make some really cool things for neuroscience. So we're going to be introducing neuroscience as well into the STEM kit uh, down the road. That's something that we really want to do because it's another core belief. Because uh, we do a lot of work within mindfulness, relaxation, and meditation. That's another vertical of the company, and that's all using uh, EEG technology. So there's going to be a lot of new amazing technology or that's going to be working with our STEM kit. And how I always love to think about it, it, it there is that open sourceness to the STEM kit where if you are that all-star educator, you can re-laser cut the box, you can re-3D print uh, the digits and really push it to its potential. But at the same time, we know, hey, we, we got to check off some check boxes here. We have to make sure the curriculum is solid. And, you know, our, with our curriculum, it's all about offering our curriculum for life of the product. So that AI curriculum is in pipeline. That Python curriculum is also in pipeline as well. And um, additionally, the CAD as well. So we're, we're always going to be adding really new and amazing innovative technology uh, because we're a company that has lived in the lab and we want to bring a lot of these great technologies to the forefront into education. And for us, it's all about inspiring that next generation of students to go on because biotech and biomedical is going to become, and we're right on that cusp, uh, as one of the biggest fields within the engineering uh, world. So we want to make sure there is a, a solution out there for educators to ensure that students uh, can already think about these things going on from middle school into high school. And this is probably the final uh, thought I have on everything. Uh, when you look at our STEM kit here, it's something as a product, it has this amazing ability to grow with the student and grow within the building. You know, that's something that we really love to talk about is because we don't want this to be a thing where I remember back in sixth grade, I built this hand and yeah, it was fun. It was a good time. We don't want that to occur. What we want is uh, through our curriculum offering and also through, um, you know, there's so many different ways you can use it. We want it to grow in difficulty with the student where they're getting that block pace and then they're going into Python. Uh, they're going into that basic design element, but then they're going to be moving into CAD design and really pushing uh, that innovative thinking and that creative thinking. So for us, it, a, a really big part of it is the, you know, the four C's of education, which is that that creative thinking, uh, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. Because in the real world, in in this uh, in the tech world especially, these are things that you we need to have <laughs> because things are changing so quickly. Uh, and we want students to also think about it within the same way that they have to be very creative in what they're doing. And at the same time, they have to include people and talk to people because nothing is done alone. <laughs> nothing in life you'll ever do, you'll do it by yourself. That's just the truth of the matter. And for us, it's about teaching some of those really amazing core values in a, through our product and our offering. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you can just write it in the chat. Uh, we're perfectly happy to answer anything. We do realize it's the, towards the end of the day of your session. So that, that third cup of coffee might have not kicked in yet. So it's perfectly fine. <laughs> um, but otherwise, we do really appreciate your time today. Uh, Andrew, always thank you again for putting on a fantastic 
uh, presentation as I was running around getting other things done. I do appreciate that. Oh, demos of the curriculum? Of course. This is something uh, we do. The guys at Peyton Group do have access to our samples, but uh, you, we'll give you more than a peek. So <laughs> we're pretty, we're pretty uh, liberal in the sense that we love to show people what we're doing and how we're doing it. And we're very open to feedback. That's something that we really like. Uh, but within our curriculum, you'll be able to see some of our worksheets, our, our handbook guide that we have in place, and other supporting uh, materials. So we could definitely get that over to you, Julio. That wouldn't be a problem uh, whatsoever. Yeah. And to look at the curriculum guide, it will give you a pretty good idea of like all the different things you can do. And you can certainly see what that actually looks like um, as well. <laughs> Andrew, while you're pulling that up, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, earlier in the presentation, you're manipulating the hand with a remote control. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that um, you pick up extra. Or not, it, it's not in the included. kit, correct? No, it comes the remote control is in the kit. Yeah, even the, the IR remote, right? The clicker. It's a clicker. Yeah. Oh, a little round one. Yep. Yeah, there the should be little, a. Yep. yep. There you go. Right in the box. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. So. Thank you. Didn't see, didn't see it in the aluminum foil wrapper. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so we love to, because uh, there were so many different ways a school could use it. So, for example, if they're doing an after-school program, they just want to start hopping into an open build and then see some basic gestures. The remote is a really easy way for uh, during that open build after school session where they can literally just start seeing some of the initial movements. Uh, and also the remote can be reprogrammed and add new gestures on there as well. So that's something that we also have supporting information and documents for. Uh, and for us, it, it's about showing how uh, within our technologies, there's so many different ways for a prosthetic to be utilized. You know, I'll, I'll give you guys, since we have a little bit of time here, how we even came with this idea to begin with. Uh, we were displaying our EEG technology at a, at a pretty big conference, and an amputee came by and said, can that control uh, a, a prosthetic hand? And we tried and tried and we failed because EEG technology is not the best uh, as a controller for a prosthetic hand. Uh, but then the team discovered that same sensor tech was so accurate and amazing that they just applied it to EMG. And that's how the uh, prosthetic was, was able to come about. And we want to carry that message and story into the STEM kit through and through because there's so many different ways that uh, companies right now are currently trying to figure out is the best way to control prosthetics. Uh, EMG has been winning a lot of those initial discovery, but there is a really big movement in brain machine interface technology uh, where the idea is you no longer have to rely on any muscle impulses or anything along those lines. You just have to rely on your brain to think it and it will do it through an EEG or other brain machine interface uh, way of it. So we, we have all these different components in place to control it because with even within our own field, that's still an ongoing conversation. We have a question. Um, can you demonstrate um, some of the curriculum just so uh, we can get a peek? Yeah. Sure. Let's see if I can, uh, wants to pull some stuff up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Give me one moment. So actually, uh, I mean, I can demo this one piece of curriculum. So we do have an introduction to. Uh, uh, Black-based programming. Um, so, you know, you saw those original uh, uh, demo videos of people uh, coding a, like that that game. So we do have, I can show you a piece of that, which will give you an idea of what the curriculum looks like. That was actually designed by, you're actually out there in California. There was actually a teacher from High Tech High um, in San Diego, I believe, who uh, put that curriculum together for us. And as Andrew gets that put together, uh, we, you know, this, well, this is some really well, cool stuff here. Yeah. Well, what was that teacher's name? Uh, Judy Wong. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, do you know her? No, but High Tech High is in my territory, and, I, and I've engaged with a couple teachers there, but not her. Got it. Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, give me one moment. Yeah, she was really wonderful too. She uh, so she had that experience. She also worked with uh, like MBlock directly. She would, so she was uh, she's been able to utilize a lot of our MBlock potential. Um, so and like we're we're happy to send these documents to you too, so you can see the scopes and sequences and how all these materials work up. Um, I will say, yeah, you know, we can go into some of these foundational lessons. So these will take you. So they come with uh, you know like all the different uh, worksheets and supplementary materials, uh, kind of the introduction to everything. Uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of what we've been using to have a lot of these lessons move forward is, um, you know, in this case, this is just the, the first lesson into getting block-based programming up and moving uh, with uh, the kit. So it ends up looking a lot like this. Um, so it'll take teachers through every step of the way. Um, everything is heavily documented in all of those lesson guides. Um, but you'll see, it'll, get, it'll introduce a little bit of topical knowledge. Then it'll go into different activities people can do. Um, and then at the end of the, the lesson, they'll give you know, anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes of some kind of an uh, open build experience uh, that then uh, ties into some kind of an exit ticket. Um, so that's one example of what this looks like. So that the whole curriculum will be structured that way. And um, you know, we'd be happy to have you look at a lot more if you want. There's so some, this is targeted. Know. Mm -hmm. So this is targeted mostly for middle school and high school, or do you see it also possibly in elementary schools? Yeah, that's so I think that. Yeah. Yes, I think we've uh, the, the the first steps we've taken uh, have been with that middle school and uh, high school group. I think the way that we design that introduction curriculum in particular is that it's meant to be, you know, people if they're really getting involved with uh, programming in some sense, and there's no real age limit to that. Um, so we actually, actually the, the group of ninth graders that we worked with in Boston, um, they, they never did any sort of programming before uh, at all. So they actually took this on. We've had middle schoolers do it. In that case, we had like those elementary school students do it as well. So it's, a lot of these curriculums are based around uh, competencies rather than um, like having to absolutely fit some kind of a, a grade level. But uh, we do have it mapped out so you can see the middle school and high school standards with that too. Additionally, as, you, as everyone probably knows, uh, education looks different in every part of the country. Um, um, a big part of that is too, like we've seen fifth graders, a uh, fifth grade teacher try to really use it, uh, but the issue is of course there, we're, we're talking there's a screwdriver, there's, there's, there's screws that need to go in there, the hand-eye coordination is super important. Um, so we, we don't really, you know, say, hey, if you want to use it as a demonstrational tool and maybe an entrance because some some schools get into block based really early on and some don't really get into it later. But to Andrew's point, like uh, we, we have found our strengths uh, within the middle school, high school area. And the reason why we've actually looked at that area is because uh, after assessing what middle school options there are, and uh, we saw that there really wasn't uh, much there to serve as a great transitional uh, point. So we really wanted to make something where there was like a great transition uh, from that middle to high school. Got another question for you, Andrew. Ah, yes. Okay, yeah, great question. So what we've done is, um, so within the curriculum, there's uh, like two different types of the activities that we have students perform. Uh, so, like, the, the first kind are those that would actually involve having to physically interact with the hardware in some way, but the second type would be some kind of a, it either be leading up to some kind of a physical interaction or it would be something coming down from it, which would be, you know, like being able to sketch out some kind of a, a way that they can demonstrate the content knowledge that they've developed so that they're uh, confident and ready to implement that on a piece of hardware. So I'll say that uh, to talk about the introduction of program module that you saw in there first, um, you know, you could run through that without touching the hardware until like the very last class. So if you're looking to get that off the ground, um, like all those things can be done completely remote. Um, if you rifle through the, uh, we can send you the curriculum guide so you can see how the other modules work. But um, a lot of those modules are uh, building up students' content knowledge of um, the engineering design process or certain biomedical concepts that students would then at some point apply to the kit but those conceptual topics and that knowledge building can be done completely remotely. 
Um, there, there certainly are some activities that we've designed to be used with the kit, um, but you know, that's a, uh, uh, like we, we've integrated as much of that experience as possible into what people can do in remote learning. Yeah, so I think that, I think that coding would work well, you're right. Yeah, yeah. There's there's still a lot of good work uh, to be done, and we're always looking at the, you know, new policies are coming out every single day. Uh, so we're doing everything we can as a company to understand uh, what the what's what, what's it looking like out there. Uh, we talk to educators from different parts of the country, um, and try to understand, you know, what can we do to make this uh, situation as easy as possible in the sense that provide the right support provide the right documentation to ensure that, hey, if you're doing distance, there is a really good option for a, a hands-on solution within a time where hands-on learning is kind of in a turmoil place. And it's still really important because every human being learns different and we want to ensure students can still have those meaningful experiences. Uh, additionally, you know, hybrid models are coming up, uh, especially in the Northeast, it's becoming very prevalent. So uh, as a company, we are doing everything we can to work with educators uh, to not only face their own needs, but also try to anticipate some things that are gonna be coming along uh, from a policy standpoint and also like a demand standpoint. Uh, because it's, it's very important that we, at the end of the day, educators need tools, but they need effective tools. And as a company, we always want to be able to provide as much as we can to help during this time. And, as, and that's one of our you know, big core beliefs that educators are first and student engagement has to be amazing. Because uh, at the end of the day, if the students aren't engaged and distance learning is a platform where it, it's tough, but we want to be there to actually help as much as we can to keep students interested and looking forward to the future, because that's the most important thing. And that's really uh, any, uh, I know we're about to, you know, we have 15 minutes left. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, we're here to answer them. So uh, let us know and, but, but thank you everyone. You know, I know you guys have done. Yeah, yep, this, but you know what, this, it does put a damper, but that just calls for us to be a bit more innovative and that just calls for us to try a little bit harder. And I know it's exhausting and it's not easy, but, uh, it's kind of funny. You gotta, you gotta go to other parts of the world to find the best ways of dealing with things because, you know, distance learning has been a part of other countries just due to like the rural population and also just due to access. So, uh, a part of our team, you know, is kind of also looking how other countries, which always had distance as a part of their makeup, how they've used it effectively and see what we can do on our end to try to replicate some of those, those measurements of success uh, into the U.S. And, and listen, look, think about this. Illinois had a law saying it was illegal <laughs> for there to be distance learning, and they had to literally pass the law to change it. So it's, it's rough, but we, uh, we'll be innovative, and we'll, we'll, we'll bring that little startup flair <laughs> into education and help as much as we can. Thank you, Josh. Well said. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, we know you're going towards the end of your day. And um, thank you for coming. And we're, we'll still be around for the remainder of the time. Uh, if you want to stay for like a little one-on-one -on -one chat, that's perfectly fine. Uh, Andrew and I are both going to be here uh, <laughs> until 7 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> is specific, you know, three hours back. <laughs> Buttons for punishment. All righty. <laughs> I'm logging off. Take care, guys. Thank you so much. Thank I'll you so much. You. That was great. Not a problem. Appreciate Thank it, you, yeah. guys. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> that, that's it's, real. That's real. Yeah, it's so much better getting this information from uh, like written text rather than actually being told it. So uh, we're letting our imaginations go wild with that. I hope that's not too bad if it's there now. <laughs>
But yeah, but we appreciate all the questions, Julio. And um, you know, if there's anything else that we can do, uh, feel free to. We'd be happy to answer them. I know the Peyton group has their kid over there, and <laughs> um, so I know they can answer a lot of your questions, and they can certainly direct you to us. And um, yeah, that's uh, we hope that we can find some way to get this to work in there. I know it's a tough time in education now. Thank you, Julio. Your questions were fantastic. We do really do appreciate them. Uh, <laughs> go be with the family, <laughs> yeah. and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be here. We'll be here when you need us. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye. All right, and that's that's everybody. Yeah, Cole's here helping us uh, moderate. Yeah. So Cole, uh, we won't torture you anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I think we're good here. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Andrew, let's get some rest. I mean, okay. Do you have, you have any right. China calls tonight, do you? Uh, not tonight, thankfully. Uh, those were yesterday. So. All, right. All right, man. I'm going to go pour a double. Good night. Yeah, sounds um, good plan. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You.